so I'm waiting outside the surgeon's office. I just wanted to talk to you guys about what surgery prep was like and how much of a pain in the ass it is. First of all, you're gonna get a contract. You're gonna basically sign a bunch of things and say that it's okay for him to like film you or not via social media, maybe because he's more social media oriented, um, obviously without the face. Anyway, surgery prep wise, so once those are all signed, I actually got a packet of instructions that says that I can't take Advil or any NSAIDs two weeks prior to surgery. For me, it was like kind of a big deal because I have back issues and I take this drug called Meloxicam that's prescribed that is an NSAID as well as Advil for pain so Tylenol is okay so you can definitely take Tylenol to help with like pain or anything that you have what you also have to do three weeks in advance or I think I did two weeks just to be safe was that you needed to book a doctor's appointment and get an annual physical but a little bit more in depth you actually have to get a post-op physical and blood work is required to make sure that you are fit for surgery and you're okay. Unfortunately, my experience was a huge pain in the ass because this is a new doctor, so I had to go there my first day and I was 20 minutes late. Apparently, they didn't call me up to be seen until 40 minutes into the appointment. By that time, they said they couldn't take me, so I had to travel all the way from the Upper East Side from New Jersey, which takes about like an hour and 15 minutes to get there maybe. So I'm there and they said, okay, well, we have another appointment available at seven. So I decided to stay in the area for like four to five hours because I really needed to get it done. This was like literally a week before my surgery. So I go there and I'm waiting around and at like 6.50 they decide to call me and be like, we actually can't get blood work done for you at this late of an hour because they went home. I was like, are you kidding me? I was like really pissed because I waited around for four to five hours and for my blood work to specifically get done for the pre-op surgery and now I could not get it done. So they were like, you know what, you can come in tomorrow. I was like, are you shitting me? Now I gotta go to the Upper East Side like the next day and do this all over again. So I go my back in, back in another day and you think everything's okay, right? Right, right? So they call me at 4.30 p.m. later that day and they tell me that they didn't get enough blood the doctor decided to read my medical clearance forms after I left when I specifically told him to look at them before I left to make sure he got everything done. So apparently they didn't get enough blood drawn for my clotting factor and to test for HIV. I was pissed. Yeah, that was really not fun. So Dr. Kim was like, hello, where is your blood work? So I was like, I don't have anything yet because my doctor is an imbecile and doesn't know what he's doing and doesn't read instructions before anything. So bottom line is I finally got enough blood work. They finally told me that I was cleared on Friday and I was like, thank God. My advice to you guys before you do any kind of surgery is to make sure one, they read the clearance forms before you're done and two, that they get all the blood work that they need. It's also very important you look at an Airbnb with a chase, a really comfortable chase because on top of like staying in bed all day for recovery with a high back, you need a comfortable area because you're going to be staying there for like a week and you need to recline and let the blood flow back into your like I said that as someone was passing by. You can't shower until like the third day. So knowing that like my boyfriend's gonna help me like shower, I specifically picked a shower with like a removable shower head and not one with a bathtub because I wouldn't have to climb over in pain. So I could just walk right into the door. You don't wanna get your sutures wet. So having like a separate shower head is actually really useful. I'm about to be really filthy. I would also make sure to buy a sports bra one size up and you want to have a zipper in the front so you can take it off and on if you need to during recovery. You don't want anything to be lifted over your head because your arms are really sore. They actually use your pectoral muscles so you won't be able to lift anything over 10 pounds for like the next three weeks after post-op surgery. Yeah, and I got my sports bras for like $19 and they were really, really cheap on Amazon and it was like two of them. So I'm glad I can like change it to them. You also can take birth control within two weeks before your surgery and I think three to four weeks after as well. So these are very, very important to note down. So anyway, I'm on my way to my consultation. See you guys there. What are your thoughts about this prior consultation? I'm really excited to meet Dr. Kim because he's so friendly. I really wanted to meet him in person to make sure that I'm in the hands of a good surgeon and I'm comfortable with the demeanor in which he carries himself too. I think that's really important. 
I don't want any like red flags or anything. It's like we're still in interview process mode, but it's like an expensive interview at this point because I already gave my deposit and paid for the whole surgery. <laughs> hey, Dr. Kim. Yeah. Hi. Nice to finally meet you in nice person. Nice to finally meet you too. All I'm right. I'm such a fan of your work. Oh, thank you. You know, like I keep watching every single one. <laughs> and then I tell all my friends to also watch them. Right, right. Well, that's a great thing with social media, right? Now you get to yeah. really see the people, like personal experiences. Yeah, I mean, that's how I found you, is yeah, through yeah. social media. And I was like so amazed by your work. Well, it's tomorrow. I know. How are you feeling? I am both nervous and I'm really excited at the same time. Which is normal. It's not like you have yeah. surgery every day, right? So, right, that's true. Uh, nervousness is totally fine. Yeah. Uh, it's a normal feeling that you get like right before surgery. Mm -hmm. and it might get worse. Like, like until tomorrow morning. Right. It's kind of like I used to perform piano. So it's yeah. like right before yeah. I'm about to go on stage performing at Carnegie Hall in front yeah. of like 500 people. It's like you get anxious. Right. But it's kind of like an exciting nerve. But excited. Yeah. 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 Well, we're going to make it happen. Finally meeting you in person, mm -hmm. uh, I want to just kind of go over some of the little details that we need to figure out before tomorrow. Okay. Uh, first one being like the type of implant we're using. We're going to use silicone, but now okay. I'm going to let you actually feel the implants here. This is a saline implant. Filled with salt water, cheapest option. Oh, most it is women cheap. don't like it. Yeah, it's the cheapest, but it just feels very artificial and it has the most amount of rippling. So that is saline, and I hardly use saline these days. I mean, no one really does it, uh, but it's an option for people who are a little bit worried about silicone, even though there's saline. nothing to worry about with silicone. Silicone implant. This is the one that we're planning on using. Okay, this is the softest, most natural feeling. Supple. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is definitely the most popular implant I use because of the natural feel. Mm -hmm. Has a, uh, less rippling than the saline implants. These implants actually come with two warranties, just so you know. Oh. Kind of like washer, dryers, refrigerators. Wow. This is considered a device, a medical device. So it has a rupture warranty, meaning if these implants ever break in your lifetime, the implant company will actually give you two new implants for free to replace your broken one and the, uh, the one on the other side. Oh. Uh, and that's the lifetime. Now you're still responsible for the surgery costs unless they break before 10 years. If they break before mm -hmm. 10 years, then they'll actually give you implants and money to pay for the surgery because they believe it should last for at least 10 years. Oh, cool. But none of these devices are permanent, so you are going to have to change them. I'm in the belief that if you change them every 10 years or so before they rupture, it makes your next surgery really simple. There's another type of silicone, okay? This is the gummy silicone implant. Oh, now, the new one. Yeah, these are the newer ones. Uh, the gel on the inside is a little bit thicker. Uh, which lowers the rupture rate, so they're less likely to break, so last a little bit longer than the regular silicone. Mm -hmm. But the downside of having a thicker gel is that um, the breasts feel a little bit firmer. So it um, feels like less natural? Yes. So the regular silicone is nicer in the fact that it feels more natural, but the firmer implant will last a little bit longer. So is that why a lot of people are trying to use the gummies, mm -hmm. I guess, more than the... So Everyone's a little bit different, it just kind of depends what their priorities are. If someone's looking for the most natural feeling, I usually recommend the regular silicone. Mm -hmm. If someone is looking for something that uh, has the least risk of them rupturing, then the gummy silicone is the nicest. Gotcha. So, these implants come in a smooth surface, kind of like this regular silicone is showing. And it comes in a textured surface, like the gummy is showing. Now the gummy does also come in a smooth surface, uh, but oh. I'm showing you this textured surface mm -hmm. because the textured surface does have some risks and benefits. The textured uh, implant lowers your risk of getting something called the capsular contracture. Yes. Uh, if you've never heard of that term, basically what that is is thick scar tissue that forms around the implant. Mm -hmm. Now all women have uh, scar tissue around the implant, uh, but usually it's really thin and you don't really feel it. But in, um, about 10% of women, 5 to 10% of women, the scar tissue can get thick, deforming the breast, causing it to get tighter, feel harder. No way to predict who the 5 or 10% is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, but this textured surface will actually lower your risk for capsular contracture. Do they have textured silicone? Regular silicone. The problem with the regular yeah. silicone that's textured is that it uh, ripples a lot. So that's why I don't like to use textured regular. If uh, people want to use textured, I tend to uh, recommend more of the gummy implant because they have the least amount of rippling. Gotcha. Uh, the downside with textured mm -hmm. implants is that the FDA has recently put out a warning uh, about these textured implants. Oh. It has been linked to a really rare lymphoma called anaplastic large cell lymphoma, also known as ALCL. 
Now, the risk of getting this lymphoma is like 0.005% or even less than that, okay? For the most part, safe, but if you don't want that risk of having that lymphoma, better to choose a smooth implant. But again, the smooth does not lower the risk of capsular contracture like the textures wants to. Got it. Cool. So you can feel them both. And you can see that there is a little bit of a difference, the regular silicone. Which wow. for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this, is there an actual number of uh, percentage-wise of how much it decreases the capsular contraction? Yeah, like 10% with this, 5% with that. So about half <clears throat> the risk. Oh, okay. So like one in, 10 of, uh, 1 in 10 people will get capsular contracture with the regular silicone, 1 in 20 will get it with the texture. And there's no way to know who's going to get capsular contracture. It's one of those things your body just may react strongly to the implants. Maybe there's something that happened a little bit more swelling, a little bit right. more blood, a little bit of uh, bacteria. Um, I can do the perfect surgery. You can do everything that you, you're supposed to do like after surgery. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you can still get a capsular contracture. Are we going to do over or under the muscle? So 99% of the time I put it underneath the muscle. Uh, okay. The reason why is if you don't have a lot of breast tissue, just say you're an A cup or a B cup, and we mm -hmm. put it in front of the muscle, you don't have a lot of tissue covering the implant, so you're going to see all the wrinkling and rippling of the implant. Also, right? it's like super fake. Yeah, so, so yes. putting it behind the muscle, now you have the muscle covering it plus your breast tissue and skin. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like more camouflage over the implant, so you won't see that wrinkling as much, right. and it makes it look more natural. Plus, it's actually a safer place to put the implants, meaning less risk for capsular contracture, less risk with problems with breastfeeding if you decide to have kids in the mm -hmm. future. And when you get mammograms in the future, it's actually easier to detect breast cancer. Um, oh, okay, so it's better. Yeah, so it's better. I, I also saw in one of your videos that you did like a half procedure where yeah. you did one half above and exactly. Half so when we see, when most plastic surgeons say behind the muscle, it's what we call a dual plane, meaning that it's half over and half under. So the implant is about this size. Unfortunately, the pectoralis muscle isn't big enough to cover the whole implant. So we actually have to cut the muscle at the bottom. It window shades up covers mm -hmm. the top portion of the implant, the bottom portion is exposed, well not exposed, but right. it's only covered by fat and skin. So, uh, you know, you'll feel the implant a little bit more at the bottom and all, uh, along the sides. If we don't cut that muscle, it'll be too tight and the implant will ride high. Uh, so it. we need to cut that muscle to allow it to drop into a more natural position in the breast. Got it. So it's still considered under the muscle. Yes. It's just the procedural yeah. is a little bit more specific exactly. above and above. Okay. Are, what kind of incision are we going to be making? Is it like areola? Did I say that right? Yep, areola oh, or inframammary. Um, okay. So the biggest difference between the two, if you want the safest scar, the inframammary scar, which means like in the breast fold, is the safest scar, meaning least risk for capsular contracture, uh, okay. less risk for problems with breastfeeding. However, I will tell you that the areolar incision tends to heal a little nicer, meaning least visible, because it tends to blend in with the color of the areola. Especially in yeah, Asians. Asians tend mm -hmm. to form very dark scars. So when you put it underneath the breast, you might see this dark line. Um, so it's if you know. if it's darker, it might blend in with the color of the areola a little bit better. So some of my Asian patients will do the areolar incision. They're okay with a little bit more risk uh, for a much better looking scar. Other people, you know, they prefer to have the safer scar, which is underneath uh, the breast. Either way, I keep my scars really small. I do what I call a short scar breast augmentation about three centimeters, you know, which is like a lot of doctors, they make some really long incisions, but I'm able to do it through a really small one. Perfect. Okay, so we're talking about high profile versus moderate and low. Okay, so these implants, they not only come in different volumes, but they also come in different shapes. So if you look at these uh, column of implants right here, these are actually all the same size. They're all 300 cc's, but you can see they look drastically different. Like this 300 cc looks flatter, this 300 cc looks rounder. So oh. even though the volume is the same, the shape is very different. So they come in low profile, moderate plus profile, high profile, ultra high profile. The higher the profile, the rounder, bigger you are, the lower the profile, the smaller, more natural you're gonna be. So I usually tell patients this will get you one size bigger, two sizes bigger, three sizes bigger, four sizes bigger. Got it. 